All right, so I think we are going to get started. Uh, uh, welcome to the new year, uh, and we are going to get started with our grand rounds. Uh, this is going to be an exciting series again. Uh, we have uh, uh, wonderful um, grand rounds in store for you. I just wanted to remind that in series, uh, we are introducing the grand rounds this year uh, in a combined format of virtual and in person. And we're going to be making the announcements in February 27th. We're going to be having an in-person grand rounds. Uh, Dr. Michael Mack, uh, who is a renowned cardiothoracic surgeon, is going to be joining us. It will be a combined cardiology and cardiac surgery grand rounds. So just stay tuned for more announcements to come. Uh, before introducing uh, for today's grand rounds, uh, let me just get started with uh, some of the information that will get you the CME credits. Uh, so we have our grand rounds going uh, on the website uh, where you can go and listen to them and get your take your credits on CME and MOC. For taking credit for today's grand round, uh, please text 17008 to the number 888-816. 4893. And you can do that for uh, the next 12 hours or so. It should be as an SMS message. And uh, if you're interested to get uh, maintenance of certification credit directly into your uh, ACGME account, then you would need to complete the step one and have the quiz answered after the presentation in the link that is shown here. This will be again displayed back. Uh, in the chat box. And the room code will be future 34. If you would have them correctly answered, you would get direct credit for your MOC um, and in, in your ABIM ID, uh, provided that you have provided the ID in your cloud CME accounts. All right, so today we are uh, really uh, going to move into a field of interventional cardiology to stand and to introduce uh, uh, our speaker for today, I'm really pleased and honored to bring in Dr. Sergio Waxman. Dr. Sergio Waxman, welcome, Sergio. Uh, I came to know Sergio just recently when we started really brainstorming what should be the future of cardiology in the health system. And I just wanna make sure this is very clear and transparent that uh, this is a friendship and this leadership opportunity to work together uh, in the health system is really going to make a big difference. Uh, I have met uh, Dr. Vaxman a couple of times and we are steadfast, uh, not just to have the bridge between uh, RWJ, uh, UH and NBI, but also other hospitals across the health system to come together. And with Dr. Uh, Gary Rogel's uh, leadership, and working together in the council, I think we have a strong commitment to make our health system uh, and provide a learning environment and, and provide the flagship academic category to the health system that we are also interested in. So Sergio, I think we are looking forward to having this more frequently uh, and to introduce him. I think most of you may or may not know him, um, but I think uh, Dr. Waxman is very well known in the field of interventional cardiology. He's the director of the Division of Cardiology and the Cardiovascular Me Medicine Training Programs, a fellowship program at uh, Nivak Beth Israel Medical Center and professor of medicine at uh, Rutgers New Jersey Medical School. Uh, he received his medical degree from, uh, from native Mexico City and then subsequently uh, had a residency fellowship uh, cardiology Great. fellowship uh, from New England Deacon's Hospital in Harvard Medical School. He subsequently became uh, a professor of medicine at Tufts University School of Medicine in Boston, where he rose in several uh, academic and, and leadership ranks, including associate directorship of the catheterization lab, as well as the director of the interventional cardiology training program, and the director of interventional cardiovascular research at the Lehigh and the Medical Center in Burlington, Massachusetts. Uh, he has been a strong voice in interventional cardiology over the last 20 years, 
uh, extensive experience with over 80 published work uh, as in peer-reviewed journals and book chapters. He has been granted three patents, two of them for novel methods to access the pericardial space for therapeutic purposes, and also an another one for imaging method to detect vulnerable atherosclerotic uh, plaques. He has been a participant in several single center and multi-center clinical trials. Samavas work has been uh, really instrumental to the development and commercialization of intracoronary imaging modalities, specifically the near infrared spectroscopy and optical frequency domain imaging, for which he has performed the first in man studies. He participates in several national committees, including chairing many clinical event adjudication committee, data safety monitoring board, and he's the former member of the Executive Council of the Interventional Training Standards and Program Director of the Committee for the Society of Cardiac uh, uh, Angiography and Intervention. And he's a current member of the Board of Appeals Panel for Internal Medicine Interventional Cardiology of the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education. So today he's going to take us through his uh, story on intracoronary imaging. We're really looking forward to your presentation, Sergio. Take us through them. Uh, thank you, Partha. It's great, uh, great to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Let me make sure I'm uh, sharing my screen. And I hope you can see my slides as a... We can. Thank you. Perfect. So th thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the, uh, for the invitation. Um, Dr. Partho, uh, Dr. Sengupta was gracious enough to extend the invitation to talk to this group. And I was uh, you know, trying to come up with, uh, you know, wh wh what can I talk to this group about? Uh, should it be on structural cardiology or something related to interventional cardiology? At the end of the day, I decided just to go with my first love uh, in cardiology, which was intracoronary imaging. That's how I started my, my career. And um, that's a topic very close and dear to my, my heart. Uh, these are my current disclosures related to this presentation. Um, and I'd like to start for those of you who are maybe uh, buffs of uh, medical history um, with uh, a bout of serendipity, which as you know, is uh, the effect by which accidentally uh, one discovers something uh, fortunate while looking for something else entirely. So uh, this is the... Um, first selective coronary angiogram of a right coronary artery. I hope you guys can appreciate my arrow as I, in, as I navigate through my screen. Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, this is the first selective coronary angiogram, which uh, once again happened by serendipity at the Cleveland Clinic 1958 uh, by Dr. Mason Sones. And I'm sure you guys, uh, many of you are already familiar uh, with the story of how it happened. He was actually doing a ventriculogram and the catheter, you know, whipped away and got lodged into the coronary artery. At that time, it was, uh, they were using end, uh, end hole catheters and that's how uh, things ended. But as uh, Louis Pasteur uh, was quoted as saying, chance favors only the prepared mind. And these were the words attributed to Dr. Sones back then which started the path of coronary imaging. He says, I knew that night that we finally had a tool that would define the anatomic nature of coronary artery disease. Although personally, I think that most likely these were his first words uh, before he said he first, uh, uh, the, the other uh, phrase. But this launched the um, path for intracoronary imaging and opened a, a door that, uh, that has led us to a very interesting path over the, the subsequent years. Since then, we've learned about the limitation of the angiogram, which is the tool that most of us interventionalists use to guide our procedures and our diagnostic abilities to detect, you know, obviously uh, the burden of atherosclerosis and to try to find plaques at risk of thrombosis. This is a perfect example of an LAD uh, patient has an angiogram. Uh, the luminogram, which is the angiogram, obviously would not detect much here. If we looked at the corresponding intravascular ultrasound image, uh, there's not a lot of compromise in the lumen, and, but look at the plaque burden in the second area, which corresponds to this. And uh, by the way, this would not be detected on a stress test. And I keep reminding 
Um, I show this slide every year and I keep reminding the fellows that that's why we cannot say on an angiogram that arteries are normal, right? Because the disease is occurring in the vessel wall, not necessarily in the lumen. And by the time we detect the changes in the lumen of the artery, we're probably at least one decade, uh, one decade late uh, to the party. Um, so this has started our, um, our journey and that's why I'm calling this through the looking glass, right? Because once we look beyond the glass of the angiogram, there has been a proliferation of other intravascular imaging techniques to try to define uh, the process of atherosclerosis and the, define the disease that we try to treat in the cat lab. Anyway, from angi coronary angioscopy to uh, intravascular ultrasound with, a, with a applied virtual histology, uh, OCT, which eventually led to optical frequency domain imaging, which is a rapid sweep of, uh, of OCT images and uh, near-infrared spectroscopy. And we'll, we'll take you through what near-infrared spectroscopy is in uh, just a little bit. So again, this is the promise of all these technologies, but at the end of the day, we have to ask ourselves, can they truly make a difference for, for interventions like Dr. Vagonescu in the lab? Um, and I'm curious to hear at Twitter at the end of the, of the conversation, what your thoughts are about this. Um, this leaves us with what I call the unfulfilled promise of the imaging paradigm, right? And uh, keep in mind that we always assume that uh, if we have a diagnostic tool that will be associated with a therapeutic intervention and that will lead to better outcomes. And uh, in the terms of this, uh, you know, diagnostic abilities, uh, Imaging, intracoronary imaging can tell us about plaque composition, morphometry, meaning the length of the lesion or the diameter of, uh, of the vessel. And uh, we can even talk nowadays about function. And the, the possible therapeutic interventions are decision to treat, uh, optimizing a PCI or percutaneous coronary intervention. And the most important or laudable is prevention of MI or sudden cardiac death through detection of vulnerable plaques. But we're gonna see how this promise has been uh, not completely fulfilled. This has to be put against the uh, technical challenges. What is the optical imaging model, the optimal imaging modality? We do this usually in a hostile environment, right? It's in a, in a coronary artery, there's a lot of cardiac motion, there's intervening blood that may or may not need to be displaced depending on the technology. And there's procedural risk involved. Every time we, we introduce a catheter, there's at least a, a fraction of a percent of a, a added risk to the procedure. That in contrast with the complex plaque composition and against the ease of use and interpretation that has to be a must for us to adopt these technologies. And again, this has to be put in the context of what are the clinical challenges. We need to find meaningful practical applications talk about risk benefit ratios and the cost, not only financial, but as I was saying, uh, all it's all about the risk. So let me introduce to you what I call imaging paradox number one, uh, which is the, the treatment is the same for us, regardless of plaque morphology or the extent of disease. And we may show some data, or I will show some data in terms of, well, is it truly this paradigm or this paradox, uh, does it really exist? Um, I'm going to posit to you that we're dealing with a diversity of coronary lesion morphologies that require PCI, from stable lesions to think of fibrotheromas, to rupture plaques, to focal versus diffuse disease. Um, and um, again, this is pretty much what we have. To us as interventionalists, pretty much everything looks like a nail, and we only have you know one hammer, right? which is a stent, which in most cases right now is a drug eluting stent, dual antiplatelet ther therapy and uh, high dose statins or anti-lipidemic uh, therapy. And we still treat the area of most severe angiographic stenosis. Despite having imaging, we still use the angiogram as a guide. Um, the imaging paradox number two is, you know, does it really matter if we find other disease? What do we do when uh, we're imaging and we find other areas of interest. Uh, let me take you through what uh, some of the data tell us. These are um, uh, two studies, one published in 2004. There weren't drug eluting stents back then. And the other one more modern is uh, the data from the PROSPECT trial. 
uh, in which the investigators performed free vessel imaging at the time of PCI. This was presented by uh, Greg Stone at TCT in 2009. On the panel here, we have the events that are associated or that are attributed to target lesion events in blue. Obviously, if the, we discount the first year, which include the periprocedural MIs, and in red, you have the events that are attributed to non-target lesion events. Let's say that you did PCI on a mid-RCA, um, but this is an event that will come back on a proximal RCA. And when you add the total, the totality of, of events, you see that in this study, at least 24% of patients had a target lesion event and 37% of patients had a non-target lesion event, which is attributed to progression of pre-existing disease. And you can say, well, this was before drug stands, before aggressive statin therapy. But in 2009, when we already had at least first and second generation drug stands, if we see again the, the events that were attributed to culprit lesions, it's at least 12.9% and over the follow up period, at least 11.6%. So still, you know, one in five, one in four patients will present to our CAT lab within, you know, within three years and at least one or two in 10 will present due to a non culprit lesion related events. So what this tells me is that there is opportunity perhaps on these patients to find disease um, that we may need to, that may benefit from some kind of intervention. Once again, um, but we need to go from the technical feasibility to clinical adoption. And if we think about the sequence of diagnosis to clinical acceptance. And if we have an imaging technology where we can detect the finding with a meaningful clinical effect that will be associated with therapy and, and an outcome. And this red line here signifies the threshold um, of, of uh, acceptance, right? We have angioscopy and uh, we'll, we'll, I'll take you through some of the data that's already here about you know, what are some of the findings during angioscopy that are associated with clinical events. Same thing with IVAs, we're starting, we're starting to scratch the surface of therapeutic intervention to affect outcomes. The same with OCT and the infrared spectroscopy is not far behind. But again, this has to put against the risks and the costs, right? What are some of the possible clinical applications? Um, mostly, uh, most of those are um, dealing with optimizing PCI results some about decision to treat intermediate lesions and vulnerable plaque. And uh, we can talk about maybe intensifying of adjuvant therapy uh, in some, some of the cases. I'm, I'm gonna take you through this busy slide, uh, but just to try to focus your, your attention in the fact that a lot of these imaging findings uh, with the corresponding effects of the, and the treatments have been geared towards PCI optimization. And uh, a, a small number of them, uh, you, know, per, you know, have been directed to this finding of vulnerable plaque, which again, this can optimize the results of PCI. These are patients that are already here. This can potentially save lives, but most of our um, efforts have been directed towards, you know, the top part of this graph. For example, we have the imaging finding of rupture plaque or a TICFA or a yellow plaque at the target site. We know that these plaques have, uh, you know, late malaposition or uncovered struts, uh, may have persistent or new ruptures. And we think that the impact on treatment that may be associated with different outcomes is the stent selection. For example, in some of these patients, it may be better to stabilize with bare metal stents as opposed to drug limiting stents or prolong that duration. However, the data are not quite there yet. How about geographic miss of lipid core plaques or TICFAS, um, or when we're dealing with diffuse disease? Again, studies with OCT, IVAS, or NIRS, and I'll show you a couple of examples that uh, have shown that in these cases, we tend to uh, incompletely cover the lesions because we're only addressing the angiographic stenosis, not where the true plaque is. And this could impact the length of stenting. But again, no data on outcomes. Uh, if we find calcium at the site, we, it may be associated with a stent under expansion that may be related to target lesion failure. Now we know that we can apply a thorectomy, lithotripsy, or high pressure post dilatation. No great data on outcomes. Uh, if we find necrotic core or lipid core plaques, uh, a large burden of them at the site, 
may be associated with no reflow or distal embolization. And again, some people have proposed the use of distal protection for these selected patients. Again, we haven't really gotten to, to um, change those outcomes. Perhaps the most important in this category is the finding of stent under expansion with uh, either IVUS or OCT that are associated with target lesion and failure, mostly restenosis. And we know that post dilating or perhaps using additional stenting may help. We're starting to get some data on this. And to me, the most important one of this is the finding of uh, uh, tick fats or yellow plaques in a non-target disease, which is associated with disease progression of future events, which may be associated with the treatment of intensifying systemic treatment or identifying thresholds to treat moderate non-culprit lesions. But again, we still have no data to, to suggest that that's what we should be doing routinely. Let's talk a little bit about optimizing PCI outcomes with imaging, because this is where the preponderance of the data so far are, are taking us. Um, and this is our data now that we're published in 2009 for the taxes stents. There are very similar data for the Cypher stent, which are the first two generation drug living stents. And uh, what I'm uh, trying to show here is that uh, the magic number of 5.5 square millimeters needs to be achieved in order to have a 94% negative predictive value for instant restenosis. Obviously, this applies only to 2.75 millimeter in diameter or larger vessels, right? Because with 2.5, if you put a 2.5 stand, you're, you're not going to get a 5.5 square millimeter luminal area. So now we know that this is a magic number for Cypher is very similar. It's between 5.5 and 6 square millimeters. Yet we only, as interventionalists, utilize imaging only 5% of all our routine uh, PCI. Even though the data, there's a preponderance of data that support that if you get these numbers when you're doing your PCI, your chance of having target lesion failure is very small. Um, these are the data uh, from uh, other studies, again, using utilizing intravascular ultrasound uh, from uh, Roxana Moran and Gary Means's group. Um, this is a retrospective look at data from, um, from the matrix registry. And what they looked at those patients who uh, had IVUS, concomitant IVUS at the time or PCI versus a group that didn't have IVUS that was completely at the discretion of the of the procedural list. And there was a difference in the groups in terms of death of, of MI, which was mostly driven not by death, but by, by uh, MI at follow-up, you know, over the, the period of two years. Granted, you may say, well, you know, the, the curves are parallel after, you know, if you discount all the uh, per procedural events. However, there was a difference, um, uh, favorable difference favoring the use of IVUS. One thing that is incontrovertible is that uh, if you used IVUS, there was less predilatation. Why? Because you already knew the dimensions of your vessel. And one of the tricks that we as interventionals use is we predilate to give us an idea of the dimension of the stent that we're going to have to put in or the length. There was more post-dilatation used. And not, su not surprisingly, there was a larger final stent uh, diameter that was obtained. Um, a separate uh, study, uh, again, a sub-study of the ADAPT-DES uh, um, study, where the use of IVUS was associated with a lower uh, prevalent, uh, lower incidence of definite prevalent stent thrombosis and non-stent thrombosis-related MI, which again favored uh, the use of uh, IVUS in these patients. So the data are starting to mount, even though there's not quite yet one-to-one -one large-scale randomized trials. Um, for those, uh, those, Dr. Vagonescu may ask me, uh, or Dr. Sher, I don't know if he's going to be in this talk, but you know, what about OCT? Can, can, can we use that to improve our PCI outcomes? These are retrospective data from a Clio PCI 2 and, and, uh, uh, study where they looked at um, OCT findings at the time of PCI and whether they could help in discriminating those people who were going to have uh, failure or, or, you know, target lesion failure. Uh, and in fact, you know, OCT usage, when you met certain criteria, was associated with a better outcome for some of the patients. And some of the variables that were detected there 
um, where instant minimal luminal area of 4.5. Remember by IVUS, we said the magic number was 5.5. So not surprising, a luminal area of 4.5 was associated with higher um, uh, uh, probability of target lesion failure, a large distal dissection that extended at least 200 microns. Uh, interestingly enough, malaposition was not such a predictor uh, or instant plaque, throm uh, plaque or thrombus protrusion. The distal and the proximal reference narrowing, uh, when you had a uh, reference luminal area that was 4.5 or less, was a significant predictor, probably because it reflects what I told you about, uh, which is the geographic miss of, uh, of the true lesion. So we know then that um, OCT can be associated with better outcomes at the time of PCI. Uh, uh, Illumian 3 was a study that compared IVUS and OCT and, and suggested that there is no significant difference or no inferiority of using one versus the other. And uh, this actually is um, leading to a, an ongoing study, which is Illumian 4, um, where um, this is actually of um, uh, Dr. Ziad Ali's group, uh, who's the PI. Uh, and they're looking at using OCT guidance at the time of PCI uh, in a one-to-one -one fashion to see if it's truly uh, uh, associated with better PCI outcomes. What I was mentioning before in terms of um, we normally, uh, even though we don't like to, to, uh, to accept this, is that many times as interventionalists, we miss the uh, lesion margins when we use and geography as our guiding strategy. And this is a, such an example. This is actually one of the first cases of optical frequency domain imaging that were performed. I had a chance of doing this uh, when I was at Lehi Clinic outside of Boston. And um, this is uh, the image shows you where the original lesion was in the distal right coronary. We performed OFDI at the time, and it took two days for the engineers to perform this reconstruction, right? This is nowadays done in, you know, a fraction of a second by the computer and by the algorithms. The color coding was done by the engineers where, where they were able to color code the features of the underlying plaque. Yellow is lipid, white is calcium, and blue is stent. So we put our stent, we were very happy at the end of the procedure, at least angiographically, but the patient presented 15 months later at follow-up with a crescendo angina. So we did a follow-up uh, OCT at the time and this is what we found that inadvertently at the time of uh, PCI, uh, remember, we didn't have this information when we did this. We parked our stent right in the middle of the plaque, right? This uh, actually, this, this represents the orifice of the, of the PDA. Um, um, and again, what we're seeing here is that we, we parked our stent right in the middle of a lipid core plaque that eventually progressed. Uh, over time. So there's no surprise this happens more often than we like to admit. This is a similar study from uh, using um, near infrared spectroscopy data from the spectacle study, um, uh, which is the first study that uh, where we performed, um, where we validated the use of uh, near infrared spectroscopy intravascularly. And this shows you again the core registration of the angio. Uh, the geographic lesion with the spectroscopic signal for a lipid core plaque of interest. And you can see how in all these cases, the lipid core plaque extended well beyond the angiographic lesion, right? And in the panel on the right, you see the area that was stented, which superimposes very well with the angiographic lesion. But again, look at all these areas of lipid core plaque that were left behind and were not covered by the stent. This is just a schematic that will show you how, for example, this is what we'll see. If this is the lumen, this is proximal to distal. This is the lumen, this is what will stand, but will leave many times the true plaque, the true plaque behind. Another talk or another story about optimizing PCI outcomes where we know that the type of plaque that we're treating is going to be associated with the healing. Uh, of the stent, in this case, when we have ruptured plaques, we think of fibrotheromas, these lesions don't heal as well at follow-up. We can have residual rupture plaque cavities or uh, a higher prevalence of uh, 
strut mala position as compared with stable plaques, the fibrous plaques, which heal very nicely. But again, you know, we don't think that this difference is actually clinically relevant. And right now, the guidelines recommend just using drug limit stents for everything. So even though we can detect this with imaging, it really hasn't translated in making a clinical, a, a clinical difference. Um, one use of imaging actually is that it gives us a new window in terms of the understanding of atherosclerosis and lesion progression, right? Uh, and uh, we've heard for years that uh, the uh, plaques, atherosclerotic plaques have the growth cycles. And it's not necessarily the old concept that grows all the way from the outside in or from the inside out, but it's actually a progression. It's an arborization of the, or a layering of, uh, of lesions that uh, with a sequence of ruptures that occurs over the life cycle of the plaque and eventually there's healing and you can see the corresponding histologic images of this. Um, and Dr. Birmani has been telling us this for you know, at least 20 years. And we know that, for example, in cases of uh, sudden cardiac death that have come to autopsy, we know that one lesion responsible for sudden cardiac death has ruptured at least between two and five times before at the same time, which suggests, again, you know, these are two or four, two to five times uh, opportunities that we had to prevent sudden cardiac death, right? And this happens in about 75% of patients. And, um, you know, more recently, this is then what we think of the rapid progression, how the plaques progress. And again, we have a subclinical thrombosis, a development of a new layer. Uh, and again, we can see the corresponding OCT images where we see, for example, in this case, this is the old layer and at follow-up, we see the new layer that has formed. And again, if we had known, for example, that this plaque was going to progress at the time that we did, that we performed this OCT, perhaps we could have do some intervention that would have resulted in uh, some meaningful uh, treatment. Uh, we also know that we can measure, for example, um, endothelial shear stress. This is one of the first images, and we can do that now with the catheter-based imaging um, this is, again, this is, I think, the first case uh, of, of uh, endothelial shear stress uh, uh, profiling or vessel stress, shear stress profiling that was performed. This took uh, the engineers several days to complete. The way we did this, uh, we took uh, multiple views of the angiogram. At the same time, we performed IVUS, and then the engineers went to town and had to do reconstructions. This now can be obtained. In, uh, in seconds, uh, if you have the right, the right tools and now actually even non-invasively can be, can be obtained. Uh, and we see that we can color code the images where low shear stress will be represented in blue, high shear stress will be represented in, uh, in red. We have data from Peter Stone from the prediction trial that shows that obviously low areas of low shear stress will be associated with um, uh, uh, changes in, uh, in worsening lumen uh, area over time and uh, an increase in plaque burden. And if we were going to graph it over, you know, a plaque, this is, are the areas where we have high shear stress. This is low shear stress. Low shear stress will be associated with plaque progression. High shear stress will be associated with plaque rupture. And imaging uh, can actually give us information uh, that could potentially be used to predict uh, which areas are gonna are gonna progress. How do we put it all uh, together? If we have um, this is an example of a patient that had an intermediate lesion presented to our CAT lab several years ago, and um, he was he 60, 64 at the time. Dyslipidemia had some atypical symptoms. He exercised eleven minutes in a stress test, no chest pain. He did have some EKG changes in apical ischemia with hypokinesis with ejection fraction 45%. This is his angiogram. And many of you could tell me, well, you already had this intermediate lesions. Maybe that's reason enough, given the company that he had to do something for this, right? But look at the location of this lesion is right next to the left main. You would agree that, well, maybe we don't want to mess with it if we don't have to. Uh, his FFR was 0 0.8, which is right at the borderline. We went ahead and did all intravascular ultrasound that uh, revealed 
uh, again, a dislocation, a plug burden of 76%, which is significant. By virtual histology, this was a tikva, and the, the luminal area at this point was 5.4, which, you know, again, depending on who you read, may be above the threshold to, to treat. But the second area also showed a luminal area of four, significant plug burden of more than 70%, and a significant presence of um, fibroatheroma. So if we believe the prospect uh, trial predictors of MACE, prospect was uh, the, the study by Brexton and colleagues where they performed three vessel ultrasound with virtual histology and they found the predictors of MACE, uh, which were mostly driven by hospitalization for angina, not necessarily death, not necessarily MI, but they found out that a plug burden of more than 70% with a luminal area less than four and the presence of a VH tick fat correlated with a significant prevalence of MACE. So in this case, we decided to treat and the patient, patient did uh, very well for many years. Shifting gears a little bit about the uh, uh, vulnerable plaques and detectors for vulnerable plaque. And this is where it's a little bit close to my, my heart. This is an image of a patient. Uh, the days of angioscopy, which are non-existent nowadays, we had to occlude the vessel, we had to put the stiff catheter, which was pretty much a fiber optic catheter. We had to displace a column of blood and do a very short pullback. And I don't know how many of you have had the chance of look into the arteries uh, or inside of the arteries and look at this, this plaque. So this is the yellow, very deep yellow color, which we associated with uh, with TICFAS, uh, you see the thrombus here. I mean, these are just to me amazing images. We have a collection of such images. And I'm reminded of what we could do nowadays. Uh, Dr. Sengupta gave us grand rounds two weeks ago and reminded us now of all the, the multi dimensions of uh, multiple dimensions of the data that now we capture that is possible now due to machine lear learning and artificial intelligence, right? But back in the day, we didn't necessarily have that. So we had to. Uh, do it manually. And um, this is what we tried to uh, um, identify. We used a colorimetric scale, which is the LAB color space. And these are the different uh, scales for, for light and uh, three different uh, um, axes, uh, one for white and black, one for red and green, and one for yellow and blue, which is the B, uh, the B coordinate, the A coordinate, and the L coordinate. And we were able to demonstrate uh, what people um, were presuming for a long time, that the, the thickness uh, of the fibrous cap was inversely proportional uh, to the, or the yellow color was actually directly proportionally uh, related to the thinness. So how thin the fibrous cap was. And again, the thinner your fibrous cap, the more yellow uh, your plaque was going to appear. We were able to demonstrate this as well for uh, lipid cores underneath, underneath thin fiber, underneath thin caps for tick fast fibrothromos and fibrocalcific plaques. And you see here uh, a B value of more than 23 and an A value, which is the red scale, more than 15, was really associated with tick fast. Uh, and that led to a, to a patent for a, a true uh, tick fast which uh, you know has been going around for for uh, which has been there for some time we were able to characterize as well using this methodology to characterize the culprit lesions of patients with the myocardial infarction which again we thought those are the ones related to tick fast to think of fibrothromos and again you see how the groups separate these are the lesions of patients uh, with stable angina and these are the lesions of patients with uh, myocardial infarction. And you see how they differentiate by their B value, which is yellow, and their A value, which is uh, red. And if we put them together, we can actually determine which are those vulnerable plaques or which are those plaques that are likely to deal, to lead to heart attacks. Um, moving on to um, identifying uh, treatment thresholds for vulnerable plaque. Um, this is near-infrared spectroscopy, which tells us about the, the probability of finding lipid at this point in the artery. What we're seeing here is a pullback from distal to proximal. Um, it's a longitudinal pull, uh, pullback. This is the shade of the wire, and these are the quadrants of the, 
of the circumference would pretty much fillet open the artery. And the, you see the beginning of the pullback right here, the end of the pullback right here. You see the culprit lesion right here. In this particular patient, there was no lipid here, interestingly enough, at the culprit. But look at this area left behind, which was you know, a lipid core plaque that was present. And again, this would not show in a stress test. This is what the patient came up with. This would be stented, this would not be stented. And again, it's no surprise, right? We're trying to um, uh, simplify uh, human pathology, which is very complex. And we're trying to almost uh, fit it into simple imaging categories of yes, take fire, no take fire, yes, vulnerable plaque or no vulnerable plaque. But we know that plaque morphology and the disease uh, atherosclerotic uh, burden is actually very complex. And we're trying to simplify it. And it's no surprise that if we look at TICFAS, um, you know, and we look at the different definitions of TICFAS, well, we have multiple definitions, right? One is the typical histologic definition of a large necrotic core, less than 65 microns, uh, caps infiltrated by macrophages lymphocytes. Uh, you, you get the gist. This is a virtual histology definition of TICFA, the OCT definition of a TICFA. And then uh, by near spectroscopy, the lipid core plaques of interest, these are not tick fats, but these are fibrotheromas, which, which have a high uh, lipid rich content. Um, and again, we're trying to histologically retrofit, uh, you know, to what we can tell with imaging and trying to create absolute categories of yes or no, yes tick fat, no tick fat. So it can't be that easy. And for those of us who dealt with in imaging, we know how difficult this can be. And as an example of this, uh, these are the, I don't know how many of you guys may recognize these images. These images were used to justify a war. Um, and again, to the point that images are only as useful as the interpretation they are given, right? This is a statement by Colin Powell, former UN Secretary of State, that, that he said, based on these images, there can be no doubt that, uh, uh, um, Iraq has biological weapons and the capability to rapidly produce more, many more. So that's justified, that was used as justification for the war. And then a few months later, he said, well, I'm the one who presented it to the world. And, you know, it's like, oops, I regret it, right? You know, it wasn't the case. But the point for us to remember is not the images themselves, but in the interpretation of those images, um, that that's where the trick is, that, that's where the rub is. And uh, they, this applies to biometrics as well, not only to, you know, to technology or, or making war. And this shows me the need for multimodality imaging, especially when we're talking about vulnerable plaque, that we need to take not only one attribute, so it cannot be only IVUS, the IVUS definition, but we may need to mix and match. And we may need to use IVUS and OCT or IVUS and near spectroscopy or IVUS and, uh, you know, uh, and the TLA shear, shear stress profiling. Um, and we may need to use more than one um, technology to define a clinical target of interest. This is just an example of um, near infrared spectroscopy, which the currently available device uh, is usually associated with uh, IVUS, it's on the same catheter and gives you a simultaneous uh, IVUS and near infrared spectroscopy pullback. And uh, in this case, the investigators also performed OCT. And what they were able to show is uh, an example of plaque regression and lipid regression and fibrous cap thickening. This is uh, using um, uh, alicurumab, uh, which is uh, an, a potent antilipemic agent. And you see at um, initial presentation, you see this lipid core plaque of interest present in the vessel associated with a uh, thin cap fibrotheroma, which uh, is present here. You also see it by IVUS in that follow-up, you see how the lipid core signature has disappeared. The, the cap has actually thickened, suggesting plaque stabilization, and actually the plaque volume has regressed a little bit suggesting again that uh, we can now see all this. This study, uh, however, did not uh, uh, mention anything about outcomes. They just thought about the imaging findings of uh, these plaques. 
just um, mention about what's our current standard. And uh, this actually, I think it's uh, in most of our labs. In our lab, we are using an uh, integrated OCT system, which is not in all our labs, but it's at least in two of our five labs. And it just highlights the, um, the need to have these tools readily available. The images that I'm showing here is how now we can co-register with angiography which in my mind is like an aha moment for interventionalists, right? Where you can integrate in your mind, uh, not, so, not so much in your mind now, in the screen, what you see with OCT or with intravascular imaging with the angiogram, which is a traditional guide. You see how we can actually overlay the stent. In red, for example, you can code the areas of the stent. The, the, the machine can do it for you that are not well overlapped uh, or that are malopposed. And then again, this led for, for um, additional expansion of the stent with additional post ballooning. And you can see how this red uh, actually is going to weigh. And we can do this reconstruction now in seconds. So what's needed, we need to integrate with angiography. I think that's in sine qua non. We need to simplify the interpretation and we need to have an algorithm decision making. For example, like an MLD max algorithm. I think the interventionists among you will we'll recognize what, what, what I mean by MLD max algorithms that we can use clinically that tell us, okay, if you see this, you need to do uh, X. A little bit about fusion imaging, um, where we can now perform OCT and FFR for plaque characterization. And also at the same time, we can obtain functional imaging. This is a reconstruction of this, um, again, it's futuristic, but the technology is already here. Uh, where at the same time we can obtain, uh, you know, uh, FFR at the same time that we are obtaining histologic, uh, uh, histologic information and morphometry. We can combine OCT with uh, autofluorescence or OCT with uh, near infrared spectroscopy to detect vulnerable plaques. Uh, but again, uh, it all depends what we're trying to use the technology for. And um, I'm heading towards the last uh, few slides of my um, presentation, uh, but I, I wanted to just um, have uh, this audience think for a second or for a minute about uh, the proper framework for adoption of intra intracardiac or intracoronary imaging and uh, what's finding the right application look like. Uh, if we have this theoretical, theoretical framework where we can measure the benefits against the cost and uh, graph them against a threshold of acceptance or rejection, then we can decide where we should be putting our efforts. For example, let's say that we use technology one, call it whatever you want, IVUS, OCT, fusion imaging, uh, and you want to detect vulnerable plaques or angioscopy, right? We can say, well, we need, now we can detect vulnerable plaques. So there's no doubt that this actually crosses the threshold of acceptance because the benefit uh, to society, if we can prevent heart attacks, we, pre we can prevent sudden death is enormous. But the cost of associated with this, if we have to bring to the CAD lab patients who otherwise would not be coming to the CAD lab, the cost is enormous and it also uh, crosses the threshold of rejection. So even though the benefit is significant, the costs are very high and obviously the benefit cost ratio is very small. If we now look at PCI guidance or PCI optimization, where the benefits are more, um, more humble than what we would see with detection of vulnerable plaques. Patients are already there, but if we can uh, maybe reduce our uh, target lesion failure rates from 3% to one and a half, okay, it's a more modest benefit. Um, the costs are much lower, so it doesn't cross our threshold of rejection because patients are already there, patients are already being instrumented. So actually a benefit cost ratio is much higher. And uh, therefore um, I think it's more, uh, it's a, a more worthwhile effort to pursue this imaging technologies for PCI guidance, for example, than for VP detection, uh, if we use, utilize this framework. And I think that's where a lot of the technology is uh, going. Uh, because I, as I said, we already have these vulnerable plaque detectors but it's not very cost efficient, right? Uh, and again, we have to, to uh, put this against the benefits of improved clinical outcomes and savings against the cost of risk to patient, ease of use, ease of interpretation, 
and obviously there's always a financial cost. These are, I think, what are key factors for widespread adoption of intracoronary imaging. Um, from a clinical standpoint, we need to have useful applications with measurable, uh, measurable benefits, meaning associated with specific treatments with definite improvement in outcomes. They have to be safe. They have to be ease of use systems, just plug and play systems. If you have to wait for somebody to bring the dishwasher cart of the OCT or IVUS into the room and lose five, 10 minutes, no interventionist is gonna to wanna to wait. Um, image interpretation needs to be automated and quantita quantitative. Uh, we can use machine learning and AI to look at the different layers of the multiple dimensions of data. And it needs to be co-registered with angiogram, which is still our main, uh, our main tool. So it needs to be integrated. And from a financial policy, you have to be low cost and uh, there has to be reimbursement. Um, so after all is said and done, so where are the guidelines today? So we still get a very modest 2A recommendation for the use of intravascular imaging at the time of PCI for um, stent optimization, not for vulnerable plaque det uh, detection. And as you can see here, it says in patients are undergoing coronary stent implantation, IVUS can be useful for procedural guidance, particularly in left main or complex coronary artery stenting to reduce ischemic events. As I told you, target lesion failure to a recommendation. OCT is equivalent. And it says that in patients with same failure, IVUS or OCT is reasonable to determine the mechanism of stent failure. I'm hoping that Clio, um, that um, Illumian 4 is perhaps gonna change the balance, is gonna change more towards a type one uh, recommendation. Um, uh, we'll see. Um, this is, I think, what the future of uh, true imaging is, and I know that uh, uh, part of this is going to make you and, uh, and some people in your group feel very happy. Um, nowadays, we can obtain a lot of this information non-invasively with coronary CTA, and coronary CTA is advancing at increasingly uh, large steps, or leaps, I should say. Now we can talk about function with CTFFR. This is an image that... Uh, was um, um, uh, uh, lent to me by, by Dr. Vucic, where we can actually perform non-invasively uh, FFR and determine uh, what the significance of plaque is. We can actually look at plaque morphology uh, as the technology is getting better and better. And now we can have algorithms that we can just turn on and that can actually be useful for prediction of events. Again, these are patients that are not in the lab. So now we're starting to talk or come back to the realm of, um, of vulnerable, vulnerable plaque. Um, in uh, summary, um, I'd like to um, uh, just again uh, conclude by saying that intravascular imaging adds information on vessel and plaque morphometry, composition, inflammation, and mechanics. And as I hope that being able to give you a brush in this past 45 minutes. I do think and I believe that the time is right to ask the following questions. Can we improve outcomes of PCI? In my mind, the answer is yes. And we try to use imaging as a quality metric in our lab that we should be using more than 5% imaging in routine PCI. We should probably be in the 20% range. Um, and the other question is, can we prevent future events? More to come on this. Um, complexity of disease uh, forces us to use multimodality imaging, especially for vulnerable plaque. However, when we talk about applications like uh, optimizing PCI results, uh, I think single imaging modality may suffice. Adoption needs to be tied with specific treatments and have clear benefits with marginal costs. Uh, and this is, again, a focus of ongoing clinical trials and further adoption, I think, will depend on all these factors that you see here. Ease of use interpre and interpretation, single catheter, rapid pullback, non-occlusive sim systems, simplified user interface, algorithmic decision making. You've got to make it easy to the user and co-registration with angiography. And I just want to leave you with some thoughts about the catalog of the future, right, where perhaps we're going to have our patients come in Maybe we'll have a CT scanner in the lab. Patient gets a CT scan, we obtain this information. Now even we can do um, um, a, a photon, uh, photon count uh, CTA that gives us better definition of the plaques. 
we can determine which plaques are significant. Then we can bring the patients to intervention. At the time, we can do our co-registration or OCT and we do our intervention. I really do believe that this is kind of the catalog of the future. We're going, we're going to have the fusion of both invasive and non-invasive images. And I, I love to show this image. This is what I call the colonoscopy view of the coronary artery. Right, I'll, I'll leave it to your imagination. And um, I uh, hope I've been able to, to convey um, a message in uh, this past 45 minutes about the importance of um, kind of keeping looking through the, uh, uh, through the glass, right, through the mirror in terms of what's coming next and how to make uh, just going beyond the luminogram, which is a coronary angiogram, into this world of infracoronary imaging, both invasively and non-invasively. So thank you. Fantastic, uh, Sergio. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to, if you would uh, just uh, bring us back uh, uh, and just invite Dr. Tudor Vaganescu to join us. Uh, thank you very much. I think um, uh, I was very excited to uh, see um, some of the Im images, particularly your angioscopy views, and those are spectacular because uh, I I'm I'm hoping some of our fellows have not seen those kind of images. And it, it was uh, one thing which is very important is that maybe we don't have a class one indication or it's only 2A, 2B, but the amount of uh, pathophysiological information and the advance that has happened because of the use of uh, IVUS or NIR or OCT to understand the pathobiology of atherosclerosis and the uh, interaction with stents is enormous to the field of interventional cardiology to move forward. And as you're mentioning, Sergio, correctly, that the fusion of uh, the non-invasive and the invasive cardiology is an imminent future. In fact, I feel very, uh, very uh, encouraged and not so shy to suggest that people, if you're uh, aspiring to have a future in interventional cardiology, they need to be having certification in CT coronary angiogram because I think a combination of that is extremely powerful. And I'm going to start, and I'm sure that Tudor has uh, several questions. I'm going to start uh, with a question. So we do have uh, recognized recently, uh, we come across a spectrum of patients, we call them as Inoka or Minoka. And, uh, and, and, Luminogram does not show us anything. Um, do you think these people have a lot of burden of atherosclerosis, yet we don't identify them? Uh, we, we think they don't have any disease or not significant disease, but they have substantial disease. What are your takeaways uh, uh, about some of these patients? Thank you, Parth. I think that's a great question. So we call it Minoka. So uh, MI with no obstructive coronary uh, artery disease, right? But it's using the angiogram, the luminogram. So we're actually defective on, our, on, on calling it no significant disease. Because I bet that uh, if you perform imaging, you would see one of those multiple ruptures. Remember that slide I showed where you have uh, multiple ruptures at a side. Um, so it could have been one of those ruptures that caused uh, the event. And again, we're not able to detect it with, um, with the angiogram. And the angiogram will say, well, there's, there's no significant obstruction. But I bet that if you do imaging many cases, you will find disease, you will find micro ruptures, uh, and you will find plaque burden. But yet we do not do invasive um, intracoronary imaging in many of these patients. We just leave them and say, oh, there is no significant disease and there's nothing wrong. And, and the patient goes home and then he comes back with a STEMI. Correct. <laughs> anyway, but uh, uh, my tutor, um, uh, your points. Well, I mean, uh, Sergio, this is a fantastic lecture and it was a fantastic uh, back to the future, if you like it, uh, journey about uh, intra intracoronary uh, imaging. Uh, I remember when I was a fellow and on a different continent in a different country, we used to do angioscopy just because someone was doing a PhD out of the device. So the images were fantastic and we correlated them with the IVAS. And we call it also colonoscopy at that point in time. Um, 
Uh, coming back to, to the, the Minoka, in uh, the original papers published from Japan uh, regarding the Takotsubos, they always, always Ivers, and they because Ivers is used far more uh, outside the US than in the US, and they found in a very, very great percentage um, of plaques that were not obstructive. So if you follow these patients for a couple of years, something will happen with that plaque if you are not extremely aggressive about that. But uh, coming back to another issue that's extremely important now, and that's going to create a paradigm shift. Um, we have lots of uh, young cardiologists in the audience. And uh, as, as uh, Sergio was hinting at the beginning that we'll fix everything with a stand because we have the hammer in our hand, I would say, no, we, we fix everything with a statin. Because once you have the, uh, the, the plaque, you have to, to stabilize the plaque. And um, I, I usually think that once you, you find these lesions in the coronary tree, they are actually a coronary expression of atherosclerosis. So same plaques may be all over the body. So the statin is a must. Now, we religiously treated patients with statin since 1994. Um, and today we start picking it up by the CT and we get lots of referrals that the patient had uh, significant calcification and, um, you know, they need a CAS. So they come to the lab and then uh, the intravascular imaging is extremely helpful to prove that the calcium is actually not, um, you know, uh, a profound, it's superficial. So uh, the, the lumen is preserved if, if there is positive remodeling. But the new paradigm shift that's going to happen, and I don't know how you, you are going to, to explain that to the patients, is the more statin they have, the more calcification they will get. So the plaques are there, they are more stabilized, and the sickness of the calcium is, is more and more bigger, and uh, the, the more statin they took, and the more uh, they, they were compliant with the medication, the more stable the plaques are but this is creating more need for debulking in real life if, the, if they come with lesions that are significant. So, so the importance of these methods and, and um, of these technologies to help actually uh, guiding us to do the procedure in the right way. But, but this is going to be an, an emerging entity. Uh, it's going to be, be picked up by the CTA. I don't know if you, if you start doing lots of CTAs in, in NBI and, and, and you see that or not, but we, we get lots of patients referred to us and, and we, we noticed it over the last year or so. Yes. Thanks, Tudor. Yeah, so we do have a very active CTA, coronary CTA program. Uh, and we're starting to see this, you know, a lot of these patients are being referred uh, to us and in many ways we still don't know what to do i think we're still learning and a cta will allow us to learn more about how atherosclerosis the, the natural history of atherosclerosis right um uh i think you make a good point and i think calcification for example when we find calcification uh, above a certain threshold becomes almost part of the healing process of an artery right you have inflammation and eventually what, what does the body do? With continued inflammation, it calcifies. That, that's part of the natural response. Um, there are studies that are um, that that have been uh, published, and uh, I showed one of the slides almost at the end that uh, shows uh, the correlation of um, soft plaque seen in the CTA um, that correlates with future events, and especially if you now put uh, other, for example, you add that to the Framingham um, risk or uh, you can actually predict uh, with a good amount of uh, uh, accuracy uh, in terms of what patients are going to have events. What we haven't been able to prove, and I think that's where uh, that, that's going to be a little bit tougher, we can identify groups of patients who are at risk, right? If we can identify soft plaque burden, if we put these calculators using the Framingham uh, Framingham rescore, but we don't know still what to do. We can put them on aggressive statins, perhaps, uh, which is great. Uh, maybe that'll be enough. Uh, and there are data that are emerging that suggest that this is indeed the case, right? Um, are they gonna be coming to our lab? Uh, I don't know. I don't know that these patients are actually gonna be coming uh, to our lab. What happens if uh, we see a lot of the CTAs that are sent to us because of symptoms, patients are already having symptoms, but what happens when you're detecting new disease uh, in patients who are asymptomatic? 
I think it's changing. It's a paradigm shift. We're going to be treating these patients earlier and earlier. I agree. So, so to do and so just so and as um, uh, in the imaging journal, as ed editors, we when we sit and talk about um, the role of the coronary calcium and the CD scan. I mean, it's very good for a virgin new patient, not on statin, and you do a coronary CT and you see calcium, you know that there's a burden of atherosclerosis that is there. If it is a younger patient, of course, calcium will not be there and CD coronary angiogram will be needed because soft plaques may not have calcium. But once they are on statin, and if you do serial, uh, we do not know how to handle uh, the serial images because when you when you when you, you have treated a patient with statin and you do a serial imaging and the calcium is increasing you do not know what is the meaning of that because is that healing uh, or is it going to be more at risk we do not know in fact it doesn't really help at that point um, it's only useful when the beginning when you are starting to restratify someone who's not on therapy but once you have put on person on therapy a serial change in calcium, to the best of my knowledge, I do not know if there is a value to it uh, in terms of coronary uh, CD calcium. Obviously, CD coronary angiogram may have role. And then the second thing is, um, when do you call a, call a plaque stable and how do you define that, right? Um, because uh, we, we know unstable plaque, how they look, but can we call that this plaque is stable? Again, that's again a big, big question. How do you call a plaque that is stable? And 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 because uh, you know it's a systemic disease. One place if it's stable, it may not be stable at some other place. I mean, it's so these are all like good questions we do not know. So the serial changes, uh, progressive uh, imaging, uh, serial imaging, and the value of all of that is again a lot of work needs to be done. So, so, so to, to that point, Partho, is what, what I was um, uh, uh, trying to convey earlier, that we're giving these attributes of stability, vulnerability to all these histological, you know, uh, uh, morphologies, right? Um, so far, what we know, we think, for example, that TICFAS are so-called the unstable plaques, the, the plaques that are going to cause trouble. But we know that's not 100% of the cases. There's probably many more TICFAS that don't cause problem uh, than, the, than the ones that do. Um, so, I, again, I think uh, there's still a lot of, the, the more we learn, the more we know what we don't know, right? Um, that's correct. There's a lot to learn still. Absolutely. And the yeah, second point I wanted to actually also highlight from your, your, your presentation was when you're doing a complex PCI, it's not a bad idea to check the integrity of your stent and your uh, positions. And I, I mean, uh, Tudor, we have had this conversation of how we are shy to just send out a, a quick pull through to make sure that your stent up position is there. And um, I think the new generation sometimes wants to get the things faster and done quicker at the cost of sometimes biting into more stent thrombosis or things like that. Well, any comments on that? I, I'll just uh, take a step before, uh, part, uh, before uh, Tudor, you may want to comment on this as well. But in our lab, we're trying to uh, standardize the practice. And it, this is a very dif difficult thing to do, right? That at least in proximal lesions, where there's a lot of territory at risk, um, we make, make a habit of imaging because that's where you definitely don't want to miss. Uh, also in uh, STEMIs, uh, in, I, I'm convinced, and I've seen this again and again, in the STEMI situation, we tend to undercover the lesion and undersize, mm -hmm. right? Just because there's usually vasospasm, it's hard to tell, you know, we see the angiographic, you know, stenosis, but again, in that case that I showed you, uh, and the data that I showed you with near spectroscopy, how many times we actually end up missing you know, the, the, the true mass of the plaque. So at least those are the two scenarios where I recommend people that we should be more liberal with imaging, right? In proximal disease, when you're, when you're performing PCI in proximal disease, especially a proximal LED to me is like, almost like no reason not to image um, and during STEMIs. Yeah, I mean, 
I'm, I'm extremely biased because of, of my training. So I tend to have as close to 99% of the time, absolutely everything. And the data comes not from the literature, also from practice. We've seen these stories with the underside stents in chronic total occlusions, because if the patient comes back, you see that you put a 3 stent in a 4 vessel. Uh, it's mathematics in STEMI. Uh, now the literature is there uh, to support exactly what you said, that uh, the vessel is underfilled, undersized. So you are going to put a stand that's far smaller than that's needed. And what we do routinely, we do, uh, if possible, one first pass before we do any, any dilatation. And that's going to give a hint if we need uh, you know, to, to do some debulking or not. Uh, then we do as many passes as needed with pre-dilatation. And uh, I, I personally do a mandatory pass before I stand. And that's done after nitro because I want to see the size of the distal vessel. I want to see the landing zone. And I want to see where I size the stand. Unfortunately, we don't have taper stands. So we always have to, to manipulate a little bit the stand to mold it into the vessel. And then after we put the stent in and post steel, we do a final run just to make sure we don't have a edge dissection and we don't have a geographical miss. And then the stent is fully opposed. Uh, so so I, I think doing, sometimes we do, I mean, the minimum would be three passes. Sometimes we do seven, eight or nine passes, depends if we work on a CTO or it's a very complex case. And this is one of the reasons why we um, actually abandon OCT as a routine tool. We do OCT extremely rare if we have some interest in the plaque definition or plaque morphology, but we do intravascular ultrasound routinely because uh, it addresses all lesions, including osteal, larger size vessels like left main. I, I consider it's a mandate to, to, to do uh, uh, IVAS. I cannot even imagine how you can do uh, left main stenting without IVAS, as well as vein grafts, uh, CTOs, STEMIs. So, so we do it uh, routinely in all these patients. Um, the pluses of, of the intravascular uh, ultrasound versus OCT are, for instance, in uh, CTOs where you work in uh, subintimal dissection planes, and when you will inject something, you will make the dissection look worse because you try to, to inject as little as possible. Patients with chronic kidney disease, dialysis, patients where you try to, to stand them and you try to minimize the, the dye. So uh, I think it's a very versatile tool. The moment when you use it, um, it's tough to do the case without using it. Uh, unfortunately, from the music trial, it was published in 98 till now, the industry couldn't do any major progress in terms of inciting uh, people to use it routinely. And um, I, I, I think on that, and it's also a question of reimbursement that, that triggers the whole algorithm here, you know, because it's easier to, to move on and do a eyeball of the vessel and then move on uh, without any uh, intracoronary imaging. Um, and then in the end, you are going to pay a price in uh, having an underdeployed stent, a uh, reinfarction, uh, or, or you struggle to deploy the stent after you replace it. Yeah, I think with those points, I think um, um, I think we should just keep this field very alive, and uh, I think we should, as a health system, look into the quality of what we need to do in our cath labs. And this is an ongoing discussion, and I think we should be able to bring this back. And creating such forums allows us to stay more and more informed. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Sergio, and thank you very much, Tudor, for doing the panel discussion. I think we are already 15 minutes above the hour, and this whole. Uh, information was going to be available online and we look forward to our continued deliberations and collaborations. Thank you very much and good night, everyone. Thank you, Thank you very much for having me. Bye-bye. Good to see you. Good to see you.